The Jets' defense is supposed to be built around strong play up front, but they did not get what they were looking for in 2021. We're talking defensive line and linebackers on today's episode of the Locked On Jets podcast. <laughs> You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. This is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Thursday, March 10th, 2022, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. Thank you so much for making this show your first listen or your first watch every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or hear, hit the subscribe button. You'll be notified as new episodes are posted, and you'll never miss an episode. And if you're watching on YouTube and like what you see, please give this episode a thumbs up. It helps other Jets fans find Locked On Jets. Well, my fellow Jets fans, we're just a few days away from the start of free agency, and we're continuing our series today going position by position through the Jets lineup, talking about how things went in 2021, looking forward to what the Jets may do heading into 2022. And today we're going to talk about defensive line and linebackers. And we're doing these two together because this Jets defense is really built around getting strong play up front. And I think what happens at one of these spots is going to have a big impact on the other spot. And I'll explain what I mean as we move forward through this episode, but I want to begin with the defensive line. And I think we all know that Robert Sala values the defensive line. We saw that last off season when the Jets poured a lot of resources into the defensive line. One of their biggest acquisitions was Carl Lawson, who was brought in to really solidify the edge role. And unfortunately Lawson got injured during a preseason practice against the Green Bay Packers. I told this story a couple of weeks back when Michael Nania was here visiting us. I was in California at the time the day Lawson was injured, and I was driving down, the, they have this this highway, it's called the Pacific Coast Highway, it's some of the most beautiful scenery you will ever see in America or anywhere else, they just, you just go down, you see these beautiful cliffs, you see the ocean, it's just, it's breathtaking scenery, it is like the, one of the most beautiful sights you'll ever see, I get to my hotel for the night, I have to do this interview that I volunteered to do, previewing the Jets, so I know nothing about what's happened during the day, So the first question is, well, John, obviously the big news for the Jets today is Carl Lawson suffers a season-ending injury. And I'm like, what what happened here? What a Jets Jets moment, huh? And, of course, the Jets lost Carl Lawson. Lawson was probably the guy they could least afford to lose because there was no other player like him on this defense. Now, you look at his sack totals through his career, it's not that impressive, but there's a guy who knows how to get to the quarterback. And, you know, there's this dismissal of the ability to generate pressure. It's really important. You know, the best sack guys in the NFL, sacks are important. The best sack guy in the NFL is going to get to the quarterback and sack him, you know, know, 10, 15. Some guys will get to 20 times a year. At best, you're talking one time per game, one play per game. The the great pass rushers in the NFL do more than get sacks. They They get to the quarterback consistently. They generate pressures. That's what the Jets needed Carl Lawson to do. And they had no real replacement for him last year. And I think Carl Lawson could have made a big difference for this team had he been able to play last season, and the Jets really missed him, I thought. They made the deal for Shaq Lawson, which was a deal I liked at the time. To be honest with you, Shaq Lawson was a guy who kind of interested me last offseason. They got him from Houston, and you know it just did not really work out, even though he did have that one acrobatic interception against the eventual AFC champion Bengals. It ended up being a big play in a Jets upset, but they just could not generate much off the edge, or at least with conventional edge rushers. The Jets did have one guy who played the edge for the most part last year, John Franklin Myers, who earned himself a big extension, played very well in the early part of the season, and was kind of inconsistent. You know, he had his moments later in the season. It's not that he was awful. I mean, I think maybe sometimes I and other people overstate his level of play, how bad it was, because there were some very good games. There was the Houston game, you know, week 18 against Buffalo. He had a strong game. He had a couple big games against Miami. It wasn't like he was totally awful. The issue with JFM is that he was more feast or famine after he got his big payday. It wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't a total disaster. He did have his moments. He just wasn't the consistent guy I think we were looking for. He wasn't as good as the guy who excelled so much in 2020, albeit in a different role in a different defensive system. 
And he wasn't the guy who was looking so good, looking kind of like an emerging star in the early parts of the 2021 season. And John Franklin Myers is an interesting case because he played a lot defensive end this year. You'd think he's more of an interior guy. You know, he's a bigger guy. He fits more of the, you know, the defensive tackle role in the Jets system. And you use, you use his athleticism against some guards. Maybe he can overwhelm them. But we're going to talk a little bit about the linebacker position ahead here on the Locked on Jets podcast. But I think what the Jets do at linebacker could impact what, the, what they do with John Franklin Myers. It's an interesting debate. But I think Franklin Myers, we know he's part of the solution going forward. There are guys who are part of the solution and guys who are not. I think John Franklin Myers is part of the solution. His year was very up and down. From week to week, you weren't sure what you were going to get, but this is a guy with ability. He's a good player. Another guy who's a good player, Quinnen Williams. I've stated over the last couple of weeks upon review, you know, I'm going back reviewing the film again. I'm thinking things over. Listen, listen Quinnen Williams may never be the top, top defensive tackle we all wanted him to be coming out of Alabama back in 2019. That just might not be him. He's a good player. He's a good pass rusher. He's not awful against the run. Now, he, had, he was not great against the run this year. He had his moments against the run in 2020. I think, especially, especially near the end of that 2020 season, we were all kind of hoping he was breaking out, that he was emerging as a star-level player. It may never happen for him. And in, honest, in all honesty, that's okay. I said it recently. We blame the Quinn and Williamses of the world for the Jets being bad, that they're not good enough. That they're only good, they're not great. The players we should be blaming are the guys who just give you nothing. You know, the sec- all the wasted second round picks, all the wasted third round picks, all the wasted fourth round picks. The inability to find any players on day three of the draft. Those are the players that cost the Jets. It's not the Quinn and Williamses of the world. Quinn and Williams is a good player. Now, we may have a discussion in a year or two about how much he's worth. And if he's asking for too much money, we may have to have another difficult conversation about whether he's a part of this team going forward. But Quinnen Williams, I think, is a good player. And aside from that, you have other depth players. You have Bryce Huff, not to be confused with Bryce Hall. You know, another two, two Bryce H's on this defense who I think has shown he's not really starting material. And that's okay. I mean, he's an undrafted free agent. He's a guy who's maybe a depth player off the edge, good speed. You know, doesn't bring that much to the table, but can generate a pass rush here or there. And then you have some other defensive tackle type guys. You have Foley Fatukasi, who coming off two great seasons in Greg Williams' defense, did not have such a strong season in Robert Sala's defense. And this is another guy, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later. The linebacker position could impact, I think, what the Jets do with Foley Fatukasi. I think that this is another interesting discussion. You also have Sheldon Rankins, a guy the Jets brought in in free agency last year. I was excited about the signing. I thought this could have been a good under-the-radar signing. I think we can say I was wrong on that one. Rankins had a few moments as a pass rusher. There was one very big pressure against Tennessee in overtime, which forced the long field goal the Titans attempted that missed and gave the Jets the victory. He he got a pressure on Ryan Tannehill and forced an inaccurate throw. And there were a few other moments as a pass rusher, but he was bad against the run. I mean, I think the, the play that will make me remember Sheldon Rankins forever was a touchdown run in the game where the Colts just gashed the Jets run defense. I mean, there was this one touchdown run. I think it was Jonathan Taylor had where Rankins literally got pushed all the way across the field. It was, it was ugly. And it was kind of emblematic of the season Sheldon Rankins had. And speaking of guys who were kind of disappointments, Nathan Shepard, I mean, how many penalties, how many bad penalties are you going to take? The sad thing is like Nathan, Nathan Shepard, if you watch him on a play to play basis, Actually, is not that bad, especially as like a pass rusher. Like he actually does win his fair share of assignments. Just how many dumb penalties can a player take? Nathan Shepard tried to set the record this past season, and then you also have Kyle Phillips who returned from injury, and uh, you know he had a good rookie season in 2019. In fact, 2019, you for it's easy to forget this. He outplayed a third round pick. He made the team as an undrafted free agent over a third round pick, Jakai Polite, which you know may not have been the greatest accomplishment in the world, but. He still did it. That usually doesn't happen. You usually don't see a team keep an undrafted free agent over a third round pick. Well, that's what Kyle Phillips did. But is he a good fit for this scheme? I don't know. And he really was unremarkable second half of the season when he returned from injury. He missed you know, a good chunk of 2020 with an injury, he only returned the second half of this past season. So, you know, you don't know what you're getting from him. On paper, this looked like it was going to be a very strong unit. 
in practice, it was a unit that underperformed. You had Carl Lawson injured. You had Shaq Lawson underperforming. You had Quinnen Williams not really building on that 2020 season where it looked like maybe he was emerging as a Pro Bowl player, and maybe maybe he never gets there. You had John Franklin Myers, a talented player, had his moments inconsistent. Sheldon Rankins, another guy who there were hopes for. Could this guy you know, reemerge, recapture that form he showed in 2018 in New Orleans when it looked like he was becoming a star? No. Just a lot of underperformance on the defensive line, or maybe if not underperformance, not the optimal level you were hoping for. So the Jets on this defensive line, there are some talent, but maybe it's not everything we hoped it would be. There are plenty of question marks heading into the 2022 season on this defensive line and plenty of options in front of them. And speaking about question marks, well, the other position we're going to talk about today has nothing but question marks. What are the Jets going to get out of their linebacker position? What did they get this year? What does it all mean going forward? We'll discuss all of this ahead here on the Locked On Jets podcast. You know, if the Jets want to improve their record next season, they're going to have to make big moves to improve their defense in the draft and free agency. Of course, we're still a few months away from the start of NFL season and NFL games. College basketball's tournament is finally upon us, though, and from all the latest odds, contests, and player props, BetOnline.net is the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. BetOnline, where the game starts. Thank you for making Locked On Jets your first listen or your first watch every day. We're free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or hear, hit that subscribe button. It helps the channel out tremendously. If you're watching on YouTube, please, thumbs up. If you like this channel, helps other Jets fans find Locked On Jets. Well, today we're talking about the defensive line and the linebacker position for the New York Jets. It was a bad defense in 2021, and a lot of that goes back to what the Jets got up front because the Jets invested heavily in the front of this defense, especially at defensive line. However, I don't think that they got great play out of the linebacker position. I think that this is a pretty hotly debated topic in the fan base. Linebacker play wasn't horrible for the Jets, but I think... Generally speaking, it may have been a little bit overrated. I mean, you can begin with by talking about C.J. Mosley, who was voted the team MVP. Did C.J. Mosley really play at a team MVP level? Well, there were some weeks he did, especially early in the season. I think he had a very strong start to the season. There were other games, you know, as we progressed through the season where he looked like himself. There were also some games where he played very poorly. There were plenty of times, and I think this was one of the issues with the Jets' linebacker core. When they make a play, it's pretty obvious. You can see them delivering a big hit. You can see them flying to the football. On the plays where they fail, it's frequently more subtle. i got to be honest with you, like, I don't notice it until, like, the second, third time I watch when, like, somebody fills the wrong gap and it leads to a big play or somebody doesn't get to a runner quick enough. These are things you don't know. I, I don't notice them watching. So I think all of this leads into there are some certain positions where it's obvious when you fail and it's not obvious when you succeed, like corner. Like, in corner, you get burned for a long touchdown, everybody sees it. If you blanket a guy and force the quarterback to progress away from the guy you're covering because your coverage is so good, you don't notice it. Linebacker's kind of the opposite. Everybody notices the big hits. Everybody notices when you show range. People don't notice when you fill the wrong gap. And I think that that happened frequently for C.J. Mosley this past season. I think it was kind of an up-and-down season. Is C.J. Mosley a bad player? No, he's a good player. Is he worth the money the Jets are paying him? No. Was he the team MVP? I mean, listen, there weren't a lot of candidates, so maybe in a weak group you could argue it, but, you know, there were plenty of bad games in there, plenty of bad moments. He especially, I think, had some big issues in coverage. I mean, there was a touchdown against the Eagles, against Dallas Goddard, which was ugly, and that was kind of emblematic. He's, at this point in his career, doesn't seem like a very strong coverage guy. But that's more than I can say for Jared Davis. Listen, C.J. Mosley is still a good player. Jared Davis, complete free agent bust. No other way to put it. The first player the Jets signed last offseason from another team, they got him from Detroit. They signed him on a one-year deal. There was plenty of talk that there were other teams interested. Maybe Matt Patricia misused him. I'm not going to lie. I was skeptical at the time. I was willing to give the Jets the benefit of the doubt. Should not have given the Jets the benefit of the doubt on that one. That one did not work out at all. Bad signing by Joe Douglas. 
Bad job by Joe. Bad job by Robert Sala. Bad job by Jeff Ulbricht to the extent he was involved. He, you know, he missed he missed a bunch of time because of an injury he suffered in training camp. Got back, he really did nothing. It ended up being benched. He's not good in any phase of the game. Talk about guys filling the wrong gap frequently. Talk about a guy who's not good against the run. A guy who's not good in coverage. Jared Davis, probably looking at a much cheaper deal next. He had to settle for a one year deal this last off season. Just not a guy, not a guy who helps the team at all. Not a guy who did much. A guy who did help the team, Quincy Williams. Quinnen Williams' brother, Jets got him off waivers from Jacksonville. A very good addition in the context of what the Jets got him for. I mean, if waiver wire pickup from Jacksonville, you're usually expecting nothing. Quincy Williams delivered a lot of big games. I say something similar to what I said about C.J. Mosley, though. I think it was really obvious when Quincy Williams made a great play. Because he can run fast. And he hits. And you love those things in the linebacker. You love it. I mean, there's nothing more beautiful than when you're watching a replay and watching your run linebacker fly across the field and destroy some guy. That's it's awesome. And Quincy Williams again, not a bad player. A guy though, I think who I think though has some struggles in coverage. A guy who you know frequently his speed works against him. He's so aggressive that he flies. He takes bad angles. He takes himself out of the play. Now, is Quincy Williams a finished product? I think he's still young enough where there's some potential untapped upside. I, I think, you know, maybe he can get better. Today's he the starting linebacker? Well, I think, you know, when you're talking about Quincy Williams and C.J. Mosley, it's not a great linebacker group, but it's one of those things where I feel like you can live with it if you want to prioritize other areas first, because you only have so many resources in an offseason. So you might say, you know what, this is a problem. You know, it's not a great situation, but... We could do worse here, and we have other issues that are more pressing to deal with. And you know something? Maybe if we make the defensive line better, maybe if we make the corners better, these guys will look a little bit better. These guys won't stand out when they you know don't make a play, and they can make plays. So there's you know some things to like there. Then you have some other linebackers. The Jets famously drafted a pair of guys who played safety in college. Jamie and Sherwood, Hamza and Nasrul Dean. Neither of them really played much this past season. Yeah, this was the subject of a lot. For all the attention this gets, these guys did not have much of an impact on the Jets. They didn't play much. I keep hearing people complain, oh, the Jets drafted college safeties and moved them to the linebacker. That had like almost no impact on the defense. It had, it had an impact in one game. In the game at New England off the bye when C.J. Mosley was hurt, they played Sherwood as the Mike linebacker. Okay, that was a bad move. That had a tangible impact. That's really the only game where I think it had a tangible impact, though. And there's something to be said for trying to get quick at linebacker. You know, these guys are probably going to be weak side linebackers for the most part, not needing to t- take on blocks. And in all honesty, the roles aren't that different from, like, what you'd have a box safety do. So I think that the, this gets a lot, made too much discussion. Neither of these guys really distinguish themselves much this season. How much upside do they have? I don't know. But... I think that this whole concept has gotten a little bit... I think it's become a, a very easy scapegoat for the Jets' problems when it really did not have much of an impact on the defense this past season. And then the last guy I'm going to mention is a guy who doesn't get a lot of attention but and doesn't play linebacker a whole lot, but Delshawn Phillips. Great special teamer for the Jets, tied for the team lead in special teams tackles. I wrote an article about him after the first uh, week of the season. Delshawn Phillips has kind of become my like secret favorite player. So I like I would like to see Delshawn Phillips back, even though he's probably not going to play a linebacker role. So we've talked about defensive linemen. We've talked about linebackers. What should the Jets do to address these positions in the offseason? What can they do? Who are some of the options? We'll talk about them ahead here on this Thursday episode of the Locked On Jets podcast. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Thursday. We're talking about Jets Defensive linemen and linebackers, I guess in the past you'd call them the front seven, although in today's NFL, most of the time you have five defensive backs on the field, so let's call them the front six, I guess. It's an interesting situation the Jets are in this offseason because I think what they decide to do at the linebacker position kind of impacts what they do on the defensive line. I talked a little earlier. There's a question. Are you going to have John Franklin Myers as the defensive end, or are you going to slide him inside the tackle? I think you could make a strong argument that JFM is better at defensive tackle. His athleticism relative to his size makes him a tougher matchup for guards than he would than he would tackles. But here's the thing. Jets went kind of small at linebacker this off this past season. We saw them 
bring in those college safeties with the idea of playing them at linebacker. Now, again, I don't think that they got as much playing time as people make them out to, but I think it kind of shows you philosophically what they were thinking. They wanted linebackers, not necessarily small, but linebackers who could cover a lot of ground with speed. And CJ Mosley came in much lighter to try and add speed this past off season. I think that plays into why John Franklin Myers was playing defensive end because he's, again, he's the more the size of a traditional defensive tackle in the jet system. He doesn't, you know, he's, he'd only be a defensive end in like a three man front an odd man front jets ran a lot of more even fronts with four defensive linemen. But I think part of that's they wanted to get bigger on the defensive line to protect those guys. So there's a question, what do you want to do at the linebacker position? Do you want to go with the status quo? If that's the situation, you may have John Franklin Myers again at the defensive end position. And if you want bigger on the defensive line, if you want guys who are more space heaters and less penetrators, that could indicate whether or not Foley Fatukasi comes back. Because if you want, if you're going to, if you're going to play small at linebacker, Foley Fatukasi may have more of a role because he's a space eater. He's a guy who's strong against the run, but he's not great, a great penetrator. He's not really a playmaker. So if you're going to get a little bigger, guys who are more adept at shedding blocks at the linebacker position, maybe Foley Fatukasi doesn't have as big of a role and you can play maybe more playmakers on the, on the defensive line. So some interesting questions here. You know, I think the Jets defense probably would be better if they, you know, addressed the linebacker position a little bit more and move John Franklin Myers inside. But with Carl Lawson coming back, that only addresses one of the edge spots. So what do you do at the edge? Well, you know, it's not a great free agent class. I think, I think in either spot, it's really a great free agent class. So I think, you know, you look to the draft and, you know, there are certainly some guys who could be available for the Jets early. It doesn't sound like Aiden Hutchinson's going to be there. I think he'd be a no-brainer pick, but it doesn't seem like anybody really thinks he's falling to the Jets at four, much less ten. There does seem to be a lot of buzz about Kayvon Thibodeau out of Oregon. And to me, that's like, based on what I've seen of him, and listen, we don't know the whole stories. You know, we don't we don't know everything about these guys, but that's almost a situation where you run to the podium with the card, I think, if Kayvon Thibodeau's there. I mean, I, that's how I view it right now. You, know, you, you never know how these guys are going to turn out, but... To me, that seems like a great potential match for the Jets if he falls to four. Uh, you have George Karloftis out of Purdue, who you know, could be in the mix early. You have Trayvon Walker at Georgia, David Ajobo, Jermaine Johnson out of Florida State. Uh, you know, plenty of potential edge-rushing candidates available early in the draft. Now, you want to talk the linebacker position if the Jets want to address it. Um, again, it's not a great free agent class. I don't see a lot of guys who intrigue me in free agency. Now, there's the big name who's out there, Bobby Wagner, who the Seahawks just got rid of, who has some ties with Robert Sala. I mean, I don't know what the relationship is. Sala was in Seattle at points early in Wagner's career. Sala was kind of in an entry-level role, so I don't know how much they really interacted. You know, Sala kind of runs a somewhat similar defense to what Seattle does, so He'd be a good fit, even though he's a little older, even though, you know, we're talking a guy in his 30s. Is Wagner going to want to come to the Jets, though, for his last couple of years, or is he going to want to chase another ring? That's, you know, that's what I don't know. And I don't see a lot of great free agent linebackers who intrigue me that much. So, again, I mean, I look to the draft. I think that there are some some interesting guys who could be available early. You've got Devin, Lode, uh, Devin Lloyd. You have Dean out of Georgia. A little bit later, you know, if you want to talk round two, round three, Chad Mumma out of Wyoming. And another guy who I think could be interesting, again, round maybe round three, Brian Asamoa out of Oklahoma, who kind of fits that role that I think the Jets want Nasrul Dean or Sherwood to play. Asamoa played linebacker in college, but smaller guy, really runs that really a lot of speed, a lot of, lot of range. I think he's an intriguing option for the Jets if he's available in the third round because he's kind of what they want. You know, he's not that, again, he's very small for, for the position, but... I think he's got pretty good. I think he reads the plays very well. And I think, you know, he, he could fit this defense. He could be a guy, the type of guy the Jets want in that role. So there's there's lots of options. I think that this is going to be, these are going to be two spots that are going to be more addressed in the draft than they will free agency. Although the Jets could prove me wrong. And this is one of the beauties of having a podcast and having a podcast on YouTube is, you know, a week from now, the Jets may have made big moves at both spots. And I'll be seeing all these comments about how poorly <laughs> this aged, which would be funny. So, look, as long as the Jets get good guys, I don't care. You can make fun of me all you want. As long as the Jets make good moves and win, then I'll, I'll be a pretty happy guy. And I'll make fun of myself more than anybody. But that's how I see it. I think, to me, the way I'm reading things right now, probably more likely in the draft than in free agency. Time will tell, though. 
That's all for today, today's show, however. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, if you enjoyed the show, subscribe to it and leave it a good review. Have a great Thursday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to close out the week.